I am actually going to start a new series, uh, and you're going to notice a a pattern throughout the entire fall, it might have even been summer, when I started dealing with uh, the spiritual biography of a nation, and I was going through the heritage of this country. There's been such a burden that I have as I've seen the disintegration of this uh, once great country, and to see it begin to flounder and forsake its uh, its heritage. And it's been doing it for a long time. It's not just this year, but this year has been a hyper speed. Uh, it's uh, it has been something that has moved a lot quicker. The erosion has happened so fast that I think for many of us, we're still trying to catch up with all that has happened this past year. Uh, most of us, I, I saw a, uh, I was giving uh, imaginary ornaments to our staff. Uh, no, imaginary, I shouldn't even call them imaginary. Uh, but imaginary ornaments to our staff. And so when I was looking for uh, ornaments, I saw one of the Grinch and it said 2020, stink, stank, stunk. <laughs> so I laughed, but that's a common perspective towards this past year. It's almost like the given that we just will buy that, that this was a bad year, when in actuality, a Christian looks at this last year completely different, and that's entirely uh, the point of this message, and not the whole series, but the beginnings of the series, because I want to focus on something that's specifically the revival of a nation. So this last, the last series I went through was The Rescue of a Nation, and it's God's pattern for how he turns what the enemy means for evil into good, and how he has a plot twist on every story. That if you were to just stop certain stories in the Bible, stop it, push the pause button right there, and then ask everyone in the crowd watching, so what's going to happen? If they didn't know God's nature, if they didn't know God's ways, they would despair. Despair is when you forget God's ways, when you forget God's promises. Despair has no business lingering in our hearts at all. Hope is the residing attribute of the Christian. We always have hope. We always have a smile. That's why we can sing in prison cells. If you didn't know that God was going to turn all of this in his way, well, how could you sing in a prison cell? How could you dance and leap for joy when you're falsely accused unless you know that truth wins? You see, lies may have a season, but truth wins. Darkness may seem to linger, but when the light switch turns on, it dissipates. We need to remember who is the light, who is the truth, who is the victor. It's very, very important for us right now. So the name of this particular message is the superhero glasses. I've actually talked about these superhero glasses many, many times over the years, However, I've never called them the superhero glasses. That's a, that's a new term for it. But uh, the phrase in Philippians, when you look at the book of Philippians, it's going to basically talk about an attitude is the NIV version. That's what I grew up with, the attitude of Christ. And then you're going to see the King James and the New King James use the term mind. You could use the term glasses and it would be just appropriate. It is a perspective or a lens through which you are viewing the world. And so Paul is in prison, and he's commanding everyone to rejoice. He seems almost giddy, like he's excited about something. We want to remind Paul, Paul, you're in prison. You're supposed to be crushed. You're, you're supposed to be despairing. You're supposed to be miserable right now. And he's saying, rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. You see, what he has, and this is even what the whole book is about, is he has an attitude. He has a perspective. He has glasses on that see things that the rest of the world says stink, stank, stunk, and he rejoices. That's precisely what we need to make sure we have in place. I have a desire, and that isn't just to pray that our nation is spared from communism. It's to pray for the revival of this nation. You see, it's not just a political apparatus, because China has communism, but it has something also swelling within its bosom. It's being stirred for the glory of Christ. You see, there is something very, very precious that takes place when evil apparently begins to rule, and that is oftentimes there is a stirring within the saints of God because they have to recognize either I live this and I believe this or I don't. What is it? When you live in a time of comfort, you oftentimes aren't brought to that point of necessity. 
we're being brought to a point of necessity. Praise God. That's exactly what we as the church need. Of course, all of us could compare notes and say, wouldn't it be nice if we could be brought to a place of necessity without having to come under communism? And I would say, yes, it would be great. <laughs> but if it takes communism to awaken the church, isn't that what we're after? So as far as I'm concerned, I want God's ends, which are, is a revival for this nation. And so I'm not necessarily going to clamor for a certain governmental structure, even though I favor certain ones over others. But I am going to go after the reviving of this nation to the glory of Jesus Christ, where they would come to know him as their savior, that there would be a redemption in the midst of this nonsense. So the superhero glasses. So this is the NASB. Have this, this is Philippians 2.5. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. And then in the New King James Version, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So attitude, mind. This is the word in the Greek, phreneo, which is like a set of glasses. It's like, oh, 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 take off those glasses. Put off those old man glasses. You see, you're seeing everything wrong. And this person over here could be saying, but I'm in a prison cell, Paul. Take off the glasses. Try these on. And suddenly you transition into a whole new mentality. It's like, whoa, you mean this is now an opportunity for my life? I could actually turn this into my parish and I could turn, this is my new mission field. I'm a missionary. I always dreamed of being a missionary. Now I'm a missionary in prison. It's a total flip on perspective. You see, where, when you wear the old man glasses, when you wear the first glasses, you despair. You get disheartened. You get discouraged. If you see any of that taking place in your life right now, check your glasses and make sure that you put off the old and put on the new perspective. The new perspective looks at life from a very different angle. And as a result, when you wear those glasses, you can't help but sing, shout, and you get a little jig in your leg. You dance, you leap. It's the exact opposite behavior of this world. The world is crushed. The world is despairing. The world is discouraged, but not you. You put off those glasses and you put on heavenly ones. So the almighty mind, that's what we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have God's very mind. And that's actually what it says in 1 Corinthians 2.16. We have the mind of Christ. The understanding of Christ, the thought patterns of Christ, the perspective that he has, we have. It's very, very important for us to remember right about now. The world wants to tell us how to think. It's actually called brainwashing. You know when communism comes into a country, one of the number one things it functions in is something called brainwashing. Isn't that an interesting term? Yeah, we, we don't think of that happening here, except for if you start to look around the culture and everyone acts the same, dresses the same, thinks the same, what's happening? Mm -hmm. It's called brainwashing. And so as a result, we need to make sure that we have the brain of Christ as opposed to the brain of this world. We need to make sure that the Holy Spirit is washing out all that that the world's trying to wash in so that we can think like he thinks in a time like this. So here's our word for nail, and this is in the book of Philippians, a mental lens through which one sees, reasons, and decides, a perspective, a point of reason, a way of thinking. This is precisely what we are needing, and this is precisely what Paul in the book of Philippians, in fact, if I were to say it in the book of Philippians, I would say this is the entire point of the book. Put these glasses on. If you put these glasses on, you can go through anything. There is nothing that will be impossible for you. If you wear these glasses, put these on, then every thought you have can be washed through this. Everything you see where the world is like, look how bad this is. You put these glasses on and say, look how good that could be. So I have some different options uh, for you of different superhero glasses that you could put on. I mean, I, you know, there's some variety here. Uh, and so if you're, if you're missing this, if you're not getting the video, I have a whole bunch of different superhero glasses on the, on the screen, which are really intriguing, especially to young minds. They're like, oh, this sounds fun. <clears throat> so I've talked about the mother eagle multiple times throughout Ellerslie's history, but it's times like this that make it imperative that I just bring it to the surface again, because it is an incredible meditation on perspective. 
Of course, you know that uh, eagles build their nests way high up in trees or cliffs or rocky crags, right? They really like the height so that they can see well. They have good perspective. And so mother eagle, as we know, is a developed, matured eagle. And God is going to liken himself in uh, Deuteronomy 32 to an eagle, to a mother eagle, as strange as that might sound. And so as a result, this parallel is very, very biblical, And so we have a mother eagle's strange and bewildering actions. It doesn't make any sense. Why is mother doing this? Well, mother sees something that baby eaglet doesn't. You see, mother eagle is going to build a mansion of a nest. And if you've ever seen an eagle's nest, it's like the the bird mansion. It's uh, it's massive, first of all. It's high up. It's, you know, the the bad critters can't get to it. It's, It's safe and it's secure. And it's downy soft, and so all the feathers, all the downy parts are all perfectly placed in there, so little baby eaglet can just sort of rest in this cozy nest. And life is good, let's just put it that way. Uh, For baby eaglet, baby eaglet has it really good. And then one day, mother eagle goes berserk. Mother eagle just decides to start hovering over the nest. Now, for a hummingbird to hover and an eagle to hover are two very different experiences, You see, when an eagle hovers, that means it's stationary. It's staying in one place. To do that, it has to create such amazing wind current with its wings. And guess where it's doing it? Right over the nest. But what did it do to the nest right before it began to hover? It messed it up. So one day, Mother Eagle comes in and starts messing up the nest. This nest that Mother Eagle built is now being messed up. And what's that doing? It's causing this nice downy soft uh, bedding to get turned up where the sharp side of the uh, feathers is now pointing up. And baby eaglet can't get comfortable. And guess when Mother Eagle decides to hover? Right then? This is a disaster. If you're you're little baby eaglet, what's your perspective on this? Mama's gone crazy. Okay, this is misery. And there is no baby eaglet that would ever desire this. Baby eaglet craves to go back to its downy soft nest. And yet, I wouldn't be giving this story if there wasn't a point to it. Mother Eagle actually isn't crazy. Mother Eagle is doing something that little baby Eaglet doesn't understand, maybe, but it's actually beneficial. How could the messing up of a nest be beneficial? How could this hover in this downward pressure? So baby Eaglet's being pressed against these sharp pinions. You know what is happening when that when that actually that transpires? Is baby Eaglet is pressing against the wind. When it does that, it is strengthening a muscle in its wings that is going to be necessary for flight. And because of this pressure, it's going to secrete an oil which will lubricate both of its wings so that it actually can fly. Without this seeming disaster, baby eaglet would be unprepared for what's ahead. So if baby eaglet wasn't already convinced that mother eaglet had lost it, mother eagle is going to knock baby eaglet out of the nest. Now remember, like I said in the beginning, this is a high up nest, which means there's a long way to fall. What kind of mother would knock their little baby out of a nest? So baby eagle says, you fall into its death, right? But mother eagle is going to swoop down and catch it and bring it back up to its nest. And baby eagle is probably a little confused, a little like some of us have been in our life when these things have happened to us. And then what's mother eagle going to do? Not fix everything, not just solve the nest issue and say, why don't you just go back to sleep, but knock baby eaglet out again. (sighs) Mother eagle's going to swoop down, pick up baby eaglet, and carry it back to the nest. This will happen time and time and time and time again until finally little baby eaglet decides to start flapping. And pretty soon baby eaglet learns how to fly. An eagle has the strength in its wings to fly above storms. Which means if baby eaglet stays in that nest, it's a nice nest, yes, but when the storm comes, baby eaglet is susceptible. But if baby eaglet learns how to fly, any storm could come to town and baby eaglet, now a grown-up eaglet, could actually fly above the storm. Same storm, but a different perspective on that storm. God is in the business of lifting us up above storms, not sparing us from storms, but giving us perspective above the storms so that we can endure any storm like an eagle. So let's look at this list. Reasoning like a mother eagle. This current pressure upon you is working great benefit into your little eaglet body. 
Trials are opportunities through which God will make us stronger. Suffering is a means by which God both purifies and fortifies our soul. Affliction is the secret catalyst that works unbreakability and unbendability into our soul. That's just the way the scriptures teach us, isn't it? That's precisely the mind of God towards us. Not just the mind of Mother Eagle, who's just symbolic in this situation. Acts 8, 1 through 4. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Oh, no. That sounds terrible. So I put in parentheses this nice red font, which isn't in the text of Scripture. It's just me adding a little commentary. Mother Eagle was hovering over baby Eaglet. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Oh, no. Baby Eaglet was nudged out of the nest. Therefore, they were scattered. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Therefore, baby eaglet began flying like the eagle she was built to be. You see, historically, what we have is something called the diaspora. It's, it's the Greek word for the scattering. God is going to bring his Holy Spirit, by the way, that's a good thing, to the church of Jesus Christ. and He's going to fill them. He's going to baptize them. And what he has promised is that he is going to do this, and when he does, they are going to go into not just all Jerusalem, but ultimately all the world to preach the gospel. Well, how are they going to get into all the world? Because if they're anything like us, they're going to stay in Jerusalem. But God has an intent that goes beyond Jerusalem. So it's interesting. God is going to use the enemy's efforts to thwart the gospel to spread it. Isn't that an amazing statement? There's a principle in that. The enemy has a design to stop God's purposes. God loves to take the enemy's design to stop his purposes to magnify his purposes. It's just God's sense of humor at work, which it's high time we get his sense of humor in us. We need to laugh when God laughs. We need to snicker at the enemy when God snickers at the enemy. We need to hold in derision the enemy when God is doing it. For whatever reason, we have a tendency, and I'm sure all of you would agree, to have the old man glasses on in a time like this, and when the enemy bemoans, he says, you need to be bemoaning right now. You need to be discouraged. We're like, oh boy, I sure do feel a little discouraged. Get those old glasses off and put on the new ones. So Deuteronomy 32, 11 through 12, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led him. Speaking of Jacob or Israel, this is how God has always led his people. Why would we expect it any different now? Are we willing to have God stir up our nest? Are we willing to have God hover over us because he loves us so that our wings would be strengthened to endure great difficulty in the years to come? Would we be willing to have God nudge us out of our comfort zones into a full drop position where we are so dependent upon him to catch us. How about we just sort of stay here? I don't care if it's all messed up. I'd rather stay here in a messed up nest than out there free falling. But when you're free falling and you haven't learned how to fly yet, what do you need? You need Mother Eagle to catch you. And most of us just, we, we wouldn't select that. But if you want to grow up, as I do, to be ready to impact this world for the glory of Jesus, right here, right now, I think we need to let God do it his way. So the amazing effects of the chase. And so I'm going to refer to the chase as this diaspora. We have this great persecution that is going to break out against the church of Jesus Christ. And, you know, if I were to have us all have a, you know, a card and I were to go out and say, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Vote, uh, you know, good or bad on your card. Isn't that an interesting question? Was it a good or a bad thing that a great persecution broke out against the early church? Uh, How do you vote if it was a good or a bad thing? Of course, it's evil, so it's not good, but it sure did produce good. You do know what came out of that. The gospel started to be shared all over the world. How would that have happened otherwise? You see, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned. He flipped it. This is God's way. So do we fear the enemy's evil? Or do we hold it in contempt and smile heavenward and say, God, what do you have up your sleeve now? I'm excited to see. You see, we're supposed to have the right glasses on. 
So look at this, the amazing effects of the chase. This is the great chase, the persecution. They're running after the, the Christians everywhere they go. Paul the apostle, well, Paul the Saul, the non-apostle yet, all right, he, he's, he's the one that's going to become Paul the apostle, is the, you know, the lead guy creating this havoc. And, I mean, they are chasing them all over the place. And then we have the scattering, or we're going to call it the positioning. You see, if you have the old glasses on, you're going to look at it as scattering. This sounds random. Or you could look at it with God's glasses on and say, no, I'm going to position you here, I'm going to position you here, you here. You see, when you spread salt on your egg, uh, you don't just take the lid off and go poof into a big pile. I mean, that's the way we would probably do it if we were going to pick how the church should function. We're going to be like salt all in one place, poof, and I want to be right in the middle of that. That sounds great. Instead, we put a nice little cap on and it scatters the salts around. You don't want too much in one spot. You want to spread it around. And we're like, God, but I want to be with salt. I don't want to just be hanging out on an egg way over here on you know, this one little bulbous side. I can't see the other salt granules. But God is seasoning the whole egg. And God needs to position us as salt granules. Is that the right? Salt crystals? Maybe that's a better term. Salt crystals precisely where we need to be. And then those salt crystals begin to witness. And then there's a harvest. You see, what was persecution becomes harvest. What are we after? Harvest. What is oftentimes needed to bring about that harvest? The chase. But we don't want the chase. Could we have the harvest without the chase? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, all I've seen, I see the New Testament model and I see this happen quite a bit. And even though I know God can work without evil having the upper hand, I'm just saying we do not fear. When we put on our heavenly glasses, we can smile at these things and recognize that if we all got dispersed and scattered because we're believers and we're being hunted, don't look at it as a scattering, look at it as a positioning. Don't look at it as persecution, look at it as the opportunity to now bring in a harvest. It's all perspective that we need. Which glasses do you have on? So I'm going to give you two options here. The first glass is the, oh no, this is simply terrible human glasses. Okay, most of us spend a little too much time hanging out in those glasses. We look at that, first of all, the news is bent towards this perspective. The news wants to addict you to wearing these first glasses. It's no fun if you look at the news and smile and laugh and say, watch what God's going to do. They, the news networks don't like that. They want you to be fearful. They want you to be on the edge of your seat, so you have to come back next time to find out what the next installment of bad news is, instead of God's in control. So first, second glasses. Look at the second glasses. The, oh yes, this is an amazing opportunity, divine glasses. This is an amazing opportunity. You see, if we're going to see a revival in this nation, the church of Jesus Christ has to get the right glasses on. So that's what I want to go through, is I want to talk about the revival of a nation, how a nation is turned back towards God. But for that to happen, the church itself has to regain its proper position of thought. It has to wear the right glasses. It has to have this mind in us that was also in Christ Jesus, that is willing to humble itself, lay down its life, and be obedient unto death. This is the mindset that is the groundwork, the soil in which God can bring forth life. So the principle. Number one, the enemy chases and God leverages the chase to accomplish his ends. We have some wild turkeys walking outside. I wonder what the symbol is in that. Uh, that's one of my phrases when I'm talking about uh, to people, I'll, also, I'll always call them turkeys. Uh, maybe I should start calling them wild turkeys. Because uh, that, that's very uh, Ellerslie-esque. All right, now the enemy, now listen to part two of the principle. The enemy chases God's people. God's people run. God's people providentially scatter into position. And then God's people become unstoppable, undeniable messengers of truth in their strategic God-assigned positions. And you begin to realize the chase is actually not a bad thing. If God is in control. So Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
and you shall be witnesses, which is the Greek word, uh, actually that's not it, it's, uh, mart- well, it says martis, supposed to be martyrs, uh, to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses, martyrs, where? To me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, God's already forecasting. He needs to position us, not just in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where we just sort of want to be. It's home. We don't want to have to go out there. And yet what you're going to see is when the Holy Spirit comes, it's going to create noise. It's going to create a clash. You have flesh and spirit. And you're going to see this tension arise. The same thing is going to happen. If the church gets strong right now, if we awaken, watch out world, right? We're going to see some some sparks start to fly. I've oftentimes said when the church gets its game on, one of two things is going to happen. Either there's going to be crosses erected for all of us to hang on, or we're going to have revival that breaks out. Either way, God gets his glory. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, 26. So I do not run aimlessly with uncertainty is what that means. I do not box as one beating the air. If I am chased with these second glasses on, you know what I'm thinking? God, where are you putting me now? Where are you positioning me? You see, I don't run aimlessly. I'm not just boxing at the air. I'm not just fighting, you know, these vaporous spirits. I am actually standing for truth, and God is leading me like a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So if I get chased over here, I go, God, thank you for bringing me here. Why do you have me here? You see, the Israelites are going to follow a cloud, and yet it is going to lead them precisely where they need to be, and at the right time, they are going to be positioned at the banks of the Jordan to cross and take the land. Each one of us needs to follow God. Where God is positioning us right now as the church of Jesus Christ, we are being readied to deliver a blow to this world. The key idea, when the chase comes, I don't just run with uncertainty, not realizing that this chase is purpose and meaning. I know that God is allowing this chase to direct me perfectly into position so that my witness may have full effect for his kingdom and his glory. Chasing Paul, Philippians 1, 12 through 14. Listen to what Paul said. So Paul was chased. Paul chased, and then Paul was, was chased. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Well, that's quite a statement, considering what happened to him. So let's look at a quick overview of what happened to Paul. And I want you to remember, as I read through this, that he is saying These things have turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So now let's look and see what happened to him. So what happened to him? From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often in cold and nakedness. And these things worked for the furtherance of the gospel. Remember which glasses you could have on? Imagine if you have glasses number one on when this is all happening to you. You despair. Talk about discouragement, you give up. It's like, hey, if this is what comes with following Jesus, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But if you put on glasses number two, you recognize what Paul is seeing. Oh, Lord Jesus, you're going to get glory out of this. Oh, Lord Jesus, you're going to awaken lost souls with this. Praise God, which is why you can go into a prison cell and sing. Do you know that God is going to work this for the furtherance of his gospel? So what were the effects of the chase? Listen to Acts 19, 26. This is Demetrius, the silversmith. And so he's a bad guy, right? And look at his perspective on what is happening in and through this chaste man. That sounds funny because it sounds like chaste C-H-A-S-T-E, but no, he's Chase, C-H-A-S-E-D. He's, Demetrius says this, moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people. 
Oh, no. Saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. These are not gods. They're made with human hands. There's a God in heaven. And Paul has persuaded, who is this? Not only Ephesus, but almost all Asia. How did that happen? Well, Paul was being chased around. Paul was being persecuted. Paul was suffering. And what was coming out of that? The furtherance of the gospel. So as a result, depending on which glasses you choose to look at, you know, supposedly like Superman, what, can he see through like brick walls? He has like this super, uh, superhero eyesight, right? Well, Jesus has superhero eyesight. And he can look at a prison cell and laugh. He can look at a prison cell and sing. And we have these same glasses. Paul was wearing them. He's like, these are incredible, guys. You need to try these on. God gave me glasses. And I have the ability to duplicate them and stick them on you. Every one of us can wear these superhero glasses. And we can see precisely what God wants us to see in every situation. So, a difficulty or a diaspora? The early church is being persecuted. Is that just a difficulty or is it a scattering and a positioning? You see, all of the book of Acts is going to show it as a positive. In fact, you'd almost say an underlying secret message in the book of Acts is the doctrine of suffering. Because it doesn't give a lot of commentary on suffering, it just shows you the benefits of it. Paul is even going to be trying to talk out of it. Hey, don't go into Jerusalem, Paul. You're going to be bound. And Paul says, hey, don't try and talk me out of this. What you see is the benefits that are going to come when the church faces persecution. It's strange, but it's like the entire book. And what's happening is the gospel is spreading not just in Jerusalem, not just Judea and Samaria, but into all the world. So let's practice. All right, we've got a big crowd, you know, 5,000 men and then women and children, and there's no food and they're all hungry. Oh, no. So that's either going to be a problem, like a big crowd with no food, or you could put on the heavenly glasses. We're just going to try it out here. All right, now what, what do you guys see? I see a small lunch with huge potential. In other words, if you were just looking at that in the natural, it's a, actually a bad situation. It's like, Jesus, we don't have food for him. What, what are we supposed to do? Don't you feel that right now in this world? God, I don't know how to speak to people with masks on. I don't know if any of you have come to that same thought process in your head, but it's like, God, I'm, I'm ready to share the gospel, but now I feel awkward because when I come up to people, every conversation gets clipped because everyone feels awkward socially. So you feel like you're being disrespectful by continuing to talk when someone else is feeling like, well, I don't think we should talk, nor should we be six feet close to each other. And so as a result, you just feel this latent awkwardness in there. And so it's a big crowd with no food is what we have. And yet God says, Give me the little you have and let me show you how to use it because I want to take that little lunch that you have and I want to feed this multitude. How does he do it? Supernaturally. God is in the business of doing things far bigger than we can dream up. So if we will hand our little lunch to God, I have a hunch, God is in the business of doing a big deal right now. Charles Spurgeon says this, said this, it is easy to sing when we can read the notes by daylight, but he is the skillful singer who can sing when there is not a ray of light by which to read, who sings from his heart and not from a book that he can see, because he has no means of reading, save from that inward book of his own living spirit, whence notes of gratitude pour forth in songs of praise. I don't know what happens to you when all the lights go off in your life and the circumstances are dim and challenging, but there needs to still be a light kink on in your soul, and that's these heavenly glasses. You see, even when circumstances are bleak, heaven is never bleak, and heaven is inside of you via the Holy Spirit. You have heavenly perspective. At every juncture, you can turn to that and read the truth of Scripture by the light of heaven so that you can remember the joy, the peace, the life, the love, and the hope that always is there for the saints of God. So I was digging up uh, Richard Wormbrandt's uh, statements on preparing for persecution 
there were a couple statements that I thought were apropos that matched well with, uh, with this message. Listen to this. A Christian does not panic if he is put in prison. For the rank and file believer, prison is a new place to witness for Christ. I'm just going to read that again because this is second glasses talk right here. This is like humorous. If you're just reading this and you have no experience with Christianity, you're going to be like, what in the world is he talking about? For the rank and file believer, those are the average believer. Prison is a new place to witness for Christ. Now, this is in communist countries. In other words, they're witnessing for Christ, but if they get turned in, turned, betrayed by someone, you know, and they get stuck in a prison, well, hey, I'm still witnessing for Christ. This is a new place, just a new mission field, uh, new people to talk to. And so it's a complete flip of the same situation. It's not how most of us look at a communist prison cell. For a pastor, prison is a new parish. It is a parish with no great income, but with great opportunities for work. Free churchgoers look at their watch. Already he has preached for 30 minutes. Will he never finish? <laughs> when arrested, watches are taken away from you. You have the churchgoers with you the whole week <laughs> and can preach to them from morning to night. <laughs> it's like a, a pastor's dream. They have no choice. There have never been in the history of the Romanian or the Russian church so many conversions brought about as there have been in prison. So do not fear prison. Look upon it as just a new assignment given by God. So how could we translate that right now? Because it may not be prison for us in the next five years. Of course it may, but it may not. But it may be difficulties that are likened unto this, that most of us would by our very nature want to avoid. Instead of recognizing, imagine that God spoke to you and says, I have a mission field for you. I have a new opportunity for you. Wouldn't that be encouraging? He wakes you up in the night and says, I have an opportunity for you. Great. Does it matter where it is? Does it matter that it's in a prison? So why would that matter? If, you go, if you're a missionary and you're living in a hut in Africa, you know that that's challenging? <laughs> it's not easy to be in a hut with creepy crawlies around you. You have to have a mosquito you know, net around you. Hey, those are difficulties. But how come that doesn't look bleak? A prison cell is no different. It's just a mission field. It's an assignment from God. So as a result, whatever your assignment, why don't you beam with excitement over it? Why don't we get excited about what's up ahead? Let's go after God's ends. Yes, we have a big crowd and not a lot of food right now. But who's present? The one who multiplies the little we do have. You see, we have everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need to thrive right now. Let's use it. If you're wearing the first glasses, let's take those off this morning. Let's put on the heavenly perspective. Let's look at life through God's lens. Your attitude defines your outcome. Glasses one leads to Judas. Glasses two leads to Jesus. In communist countries, the biggest deal is the church doesn't want Judas's. And so from a young developing stage in your Christianity, you will be talked to about the fact that you're being entrusted with new glasses. First glasses are betraying glasses because you're going to think about your own skin when it comes down to it. See, that's the problem with the first glasses. You're thinking about you, what this means for you, the comfort level for you, as opposed to Second glasses are thinking about Jesus. You can only look at life through Jesus' lens when you wear his glasses and you think about his priority above your own. And as a result, the end result of your life is you show Jesus. The last thing we want to do is show Judas in a time of crisis where you get under torture and the first thing you do is give up 50 believers over to the communists for them to do with as they see fit. You see, our job is to be as Jesus. Richard Wormbrandt, we have had in communist countries very big surprises. There have been gifted preachers and writers of Christian's book, uh, Christian books who have become traitors. 
The composer of the best hymnal of Romania became the composer of the best communist hymnal of Romania. Everything depends on whether we have remained in the sphere of words or if we are merged with the divine realities. For each and every one of us, we can, we can have the words of truth around us and we can nod along and we can say amen to them. But do we have the intimate walk with Christ? Are we learning to rejoice in the small things? You see, if you're wanting to rejoice in a prison camp, you need to rejoice now with getting up early to seek after Jesus. When you have a small, trivial challenge in your life, you have to learn how to sing. You have to learn how to rejoice when you're falsely accused. You have to learn how to do that now. Don't wait for the greater trial. You have to get used to these glasses, these heavenly glasses in the now. In the current trials and challenges that you are facing, if you will learn to rejoice in those, well then you're setting yourself up to rejoice in bigger trials. However, the reverse is also true. If you do not rejoice in the small trials now, when the trials enlarge, actually you will do the opposite of what you really desire to do. So I've been talking about these. Typically, I, I've called them the big four, but then I had uh, a guy email me and say, I think there's a fifth. And I agree. I, I, I liked his fifth, which was apathy. But these are the big five, the movements of evil into our country right now. These are five operations that the enemy is behind. Lawlessness, murder, fear, deception, and apathy. Or as someone prayed this morning, complacency. This is a, a movement, and we see in the church, for instance, I, I have never seen such complacency in the church as I do now. It is weird, and everyone has their justification. Well, yeah, it's illegal for me to go to church right now. The church has been illegal since it hatched 2,000 years ago. When in the world did we start reasoning that way? We thrive in illegality as a church. Civil disobedience is like in our hip pocket. We follow the king of kings. And if he leads us to go in a direction that the civil government says we can't, we go and we follow our king. So as a result, there's no place for complacency in a time like this. This is our hour as the church to show the world how we live and who we follow. So lawlessness, murder, fear, deception, and apathy. So what I decided to do is come up with five positive ones. Instead of just talking about what the enemy is doing, let's talk about what God is doing, okay? So we'll call these the big five, okay? Hope, charity, integrity, fearlessness, and vigor. So now I, I chose different words than maybe you're used to on purpose just to sort of give a new flavoring to it. But hope, hope is critical right now. The devil wants to snuff out hope at every turn. Now there's no more hope. You might as well stop praying. We as Christians never give up hope. Hope is a trust that we have, and it's based on the nature and the character and the promises of God. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Therefore, we have hope. At every turn, we have it. So don't give it up. Hold on to it. It is critical. The enemy wants to snuff it out. He says, hey, give it up. Drop it. Drop it. Do not drop your hope. So God is going to come through. That's the statement next to hope. Look at this one, charity. Now, usually we're going to translate that as love, right? However, if I just say love, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I say charity, it catches you a little off guard. You're like, huh, what? what? And you might listen a little longer, right? So look at this, desiring the best for my enemies. This is critical right now. You see, if we play the game that the world is setting us up for, it's us against them. Instead of us being for Christ, and we're on Christ's side for everyone. We want to see all men saved. And we know when the Salvation Army came into a town, you know what its number one agenda was when it came into any town, any city? It was to take the most infamous sinner and go after him. Why? Because the most infamous sinner, when he comes to Christ, is quite a testimony to the rest of the community. What if we thought that way right now? What if we loved the most infamous sinners in our culture right now and went after them? Why not? Let's be bold with our love, with our charity. Integrity, watchfulness over every soul movement. I think it is absolutely imperative that we are marked by integrity and purity as the church of Jesus Christ right now, which means we need extra vigilance in our thoughts, in our feelings, 
in our attitudes, in the words we speak, we need to have an extra protection around that. When you are in a time of crisis, you have a tendency to let down your guard. You get flustered and frustrated quicker. You speak things that you wouldn't otherwise speak. You send emails way too quickly. In other words, you, you do things that are not marked by the love, the character of Jesus. We have to have an extra guard in this time. When the enemy is coming in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And we need to agree with the Spirit of the Lord right now in our life. Number four, fearlessness. The enemy's coming in with fear. We hit it back with fearlessness. Unintimidated by the enemy's bluff. And that's what I'm going to call it. It's a bluff, guys. Who's in control? Who's the victor? Who finished the work? His name is Jesus Christ. The enemy is defeated. He wants to tell you that he has the upper hand and that he rules. And we need to answer back totally unintimidated with a fearless calm. My God's in control. Thank you for reminding me of that. Vigor. Energy for the pursuit of his glory and fame. Have you ever felt that tiredness? Just sort of that lethargy of soul. It's like, oh, I just hope someone out there is going to do something good to fight for God's truth. But right now, I'm just so tired. It is critical that we are vigorous as the saints of God to rise up right now, to unite right now, to do as much praying as God asks of us instead of, well, you know, I'll give my token time for prayer here. I think we need to freshly consecrate ourselves to the King of Kings and say, here I am. Whatever you desire, you can use. Spend it. And if he wants to draw 100% and tax you completely, guess what? You know that he will replenish. So whatever he asks for, he will make up for too. He will not leave you just a heap on the ground. If he asks for everything, he will give you everything back. God, whatever he takes from you, he restores full. So are you willing to give up everything, which includes resource, which includes time, which includes your energies. Ah, God, I don't want to have you get full control over those. Right now, we need to give the vigor we have. What we have, let's just stick it on the table and say, God, here's what I have. And you may be just a little drummer boy with just a little song. God, here's my little song. Here's my lunch, my fishes and my loaves. Take it and use it. Final meditation, guys. Being chased. That still sounds bad. If you're hearing this via uh, podcast, then you're, you're, you're misunderstanding what I mean by chase. Chase, being run after, being persecuted. Philippians 1, 12 through 14, I read this earlier, but I want you to think about this right now in light of your life, your personal testimony, and where the church is going. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So I'm going to give a testimony, a witness, and I'm going to make that my statement. But I want you all to know that the things which have happened to me, there's been a lot of things that have happened to me, have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. In my own life, and understanding the clarity of the gospel myself personally, and in the sharing of the gospel. It's funny, but when you go through difficulty, you have a greater capacity to help others in difficulty. If you allow the Spirit of God to turn it, of course, you could harden in your difficulty and become, you know, ornery, uh, but that's not what the Spirit of God is doing. If you allow the Spirit of God to work through your difficulties, you actually become a greater mm, purveyor, a greater sharer of the truth of Jesus Christ. And so for us in here, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which have happened to us have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I don't know if that's your personal testimony. It could be. In other words, it depends on which glasses you're wearing. If you're wearing first man glasses, your difficulties defeat you. If you're wearing second man glasses, godly glasses, no matter what you face, it makes you stronger. No matter what you go through, the gospel actually comes to your life at a greater measure. So, Let's just make a choice, guys. Let's make a choice to put off our sour perspectives and put on his joyful perspective this morning. We might as well leave here laughing, giggling. Remember the, the jig in your right leg? Get the jig going. Let's 
Get excited about the fact that we are alive right now in this country, and this country needs light to shine, and we have it. This country needs truth, and we have it. Thank you, Lord, for putting me right here, right now. This is our assignment. It could change in the future, and you could end up in a prison cell with an assignment, but right now, for some of us, you're like, I am in a prison cell. <laughs> it's called lockdown, COVID lockdown. All right, this is our opportunity. In this prison cell, which is a pretty big one, let's sing. Let's rejoice. Let's do what Jesus would do if he is truly in our body. Let's do what he would do to prove that he is. Father, here we are. We want to see through your eyes, through your perspective. Lord, we see our country and its demise, its erosion, its loss of virtue, its celebration of evil. And we have grief. But Lord Jesus, we want to see that as a grand opportunity because evil leads to destitution. It leads to despair. It leads to an awakening to a great soul need. And Lord Jesus, we have the solution for that. It is called the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Lord Jesus, sharpen us for this time in which we live. Empower us by your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, may we be ready to give the good news of Jesus Christ. It's in the precious name we ask this.